right now, the Jewish authorities are plotting against me to have me killed. My life and the lives of my friends are in jeopardy. People who have traveled with me over the last three years may be involved. I am Jesus of Nazareth. This is the longest day of my life. The following takes place between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. on the day of the Jewish Passover in Jerusalem, 31 A.D. I have a dog named Emily. She's one year old. And um, I came home this last week and uh, drove up into the driveway. The, she was in the backyard. She heard I'd come home. And so she came up to me and she started running back and forth as fast as she could from one side of the driveway to the other and then into the backyard and then back towards the front yard. She does this all the time. Our family, we call this having her demon moment. And every once in a while, my dog has what we call these demon moments. But this week, you know, a particularly long week with BBS, I was sitting at my computer by the back door working on some different things, and she comes up and she whimpers and she wants to be let out. So I get up and I let her out, and I close the door, and I sit down, and she's at the back door whimpering to get back in. So I get up, and I go to the back door, and I let her in. And I close the door, and I sit down, and she's at the door whimpering to be let out again. I said, where do you want to go? Is there another dimension that you want to enter into? Because I'd sure like to put you there. She was amazingly fickle. She didn't want to be in. She didn't want to be out. Have you ever happened to any of you with your animals? I see you nodding. Yes, there are demon moments. Folks, this crowd... This crowd was just as bad as my dog. Think about it. Look at our text this morning. Both texts um, from our gospel lesson this morning. From Matthew, we read about this crowd. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt. They placed their cloaks on them. Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and they spread them on the road, and the crowds went ahead of them, and they shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I mean, this was a big party coming into town. People were amazed at this man. So many people were amazed, as a matter of fact, that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city stirred. And they said, who is this man? Now, the estimates are that there may have been as many as 350,000 people in Jerusalem. Now, to put that into perspective, the population of the city limits of Tucson is a half a million people. So we're talking about a lot of people in Jerusalem for the Passover, and they're all trying to figure out who is this man, but the crowds, the crowds that had followed Jesus in, the crowds that were shouting Hosanna, the crowds that were watching this king enter on a donkey, going right into Jerusalem, what did they say? This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus rides in on Palm Sunday, like our kids so gloriously represented this morning. But not a few days later, just a few days later, Listen again from Matthew 27, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead the crowds, the uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd and he said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility, pointing to the crowd. But the crowd answered, well, fine, let his blood be on us and on our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged, and he handed him over to be crucified. They're just as fickle as my dog, Emily. At the beginning of the week, they're so excited to see Jesus, and yet at the end of the week, they want to crucify him. So the question that everybody always wants to know is, how is it that this crowd that was so excited to see Jesus five days ago, now they want to see him crucified. Is it the same crowd? Is it a different crowd? 
And how could they possibly have done such a radical shift? And the answer to that question is, I think we can look into some of the people that may have been in that crowd and answer that question. So who was in that crowd? Well, we know for sure at least one group of people that were in that crowd, right? The disciples. They entered in with Jesus. They were there. We know that Peter himself, that he was in Jerusalem and that there was even a lady that came to him and said, hey, aren't you one of those people that came in with Jesus? And he denies him three times. And when the crowd is there shouting, crucify him, crucify him, where were the disciples? And the fact is they were afraid, weren't they? They were afraid for their own lives. When the time came for them to say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, I am a member of his clan, I am with him all the way even to death, they skedaddled, didn't they? They got out of there. They didn't even want to be seen. But I know that they had to have been in the crowd. They had to have been in the crowd as Jesus walked from Pilate all the way to Golgotha, what they call the Via Della Rosa, the road of sorrow. And as they were in the crowd watching their Savior go by, I wonder if they hid their eyes in shame, knowing that they didn't have the courage to stand up and say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. There may have been some other people in the crowd. Some of the people who traveled with Jesus all throughout Galilee and saw all the miracles. We know that just prior to Jesus entering into Jerusalem, that a man named Lazarus had risen from the dead, and a whole bunch of people saw that. And those people surely were in Jerusalem. And when Jesus was in Nazareth, he healed people. He healed the lame. He healed the sick. There were the ten lepers. He touched them. All these people more than likely were in Jerusalem. How about the crowd, the 5,000 people that Jesus fed with two loaves, and, or the loaves and the fish? That amazing miracle. Some of those people surely we're part of the 350,000 people that were in Jerusalem that day. you got to ask yourself, where were they? Well, they were probably confused. They were probably angry. They'd seen all these miracles, and they're wondering, what is he doing? Why doesn't he stop this travesty from happening? I saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. Where, what's he doing? And then when they realized that he wasn't going to do anything about it, they thought he was going to be a king, he was going to take over Jerusalem, but now he's going to go off and die? You can imagine that these people got a little bit angry. They got angry because God wasn't doing what they expected him to do. They thought he was going to go up to Jerusalem and take over, and instead he goes to Jerusalem and dies. So those people were probably in the crowd. But I think there was probably at least one more group of people in the crowd, and that is the crowd itself. The crowd that were standing there, and they're saying, who's this? Oh, it's Jesus. And they start singing Hosanna, and they're like, oh yeah, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. This is great. This is a party. And then they're the crowd. They go, and they are there in front of Jesus in the trial, and everybody's going, crucify, crucify. And the crowd's like, oh yeah, crucify, crucify, crucify. They're like sheep. They have no idea what they're doing. They're just going and following the crowd. They could care less. Wherever the crowd goes, that's where they go. The crowd goes, oh, I'm going to go this way. So we know they're in the crowd. The question I want to ask you this morning is, were you in the crowd? We sang that beautiful hymn, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it just causes me to tremble. And the fact is that you were in the crowd. Not there physically, but you were there representing the things that you've done in your life just like the crowd. Because there have been times in your life, I know, when Jesus has called you to stand up and say, I am one of his disciples. And you've hid your head in shame and said, I'm not going to stand up for Jesus. I remember I had a friend of mine who worked for a guy, and this guy was not a Christian, he was his boss. As a matter of fact, he was not only Christian, but he did not like Christians at all. And my friend really felt uncomfortable working for this guy 
because he was always afraid that he was going to say something wrong or do something wrong, and this, and, and this guy was just going to come down on him. And one time, his boss said, you know, we're going to go out to a restaurant. It's not a very good restaurant, and, you know, we're going to all go and do that. And my friend stood up and he said, you know, I just can't do that. I can't go to that restaurant. And the, his boss looked at me and said, well, why not? He said, well, uh, I just don't think my wife would enjoy it. And he said, well, my wife doesn't care if I go. And then he said, well, my wife would. And besides, I just don't think that I should be going there. But he didn't tell him why. So he didn't go, and my boss was still angry at him. And then there was another time, um, another people in the crowd. The second people was uh, confused and angry. How many times has this happened in your life? When God goes down one path and you expect Him to go another path. How many times in your life when God has done something totally different than what you thought He was going to do or what you thought He should do? Maybe heal you from some sickness or take some pain away from you and you pray, Lord, take this away from me. And you're sure that He's going to do it, but God goes off in another direction. At first you're confused and then you get angry. Or are you maybe like the third crowd? The third crowd that just goes along with everybody else. What everybody else is doing, that's what I'm going to do. If they're going to go over here and walk this way, I'm going to walk this way. This summer, we're going to study the prophet Jeremiah. And the prophet Jeremiah lived at the time of Israel when everybody was going in one direction. And our computer, th- our, uh, our image for this sermon series is going to be going up the down escalator. Because the prophet Jeremiah is going down the escalator and then he realizes from God that everybody's going in the wrong direction. And Jeremiah turns around and starts going the opposite direction of the escalator and taking a stand against the crowd. How many times have you done that? The fact is that Jesus stood before Pilate and they said, crucify him. And they parted the way. And Jesus started to walk that lonely road from Pilate to Golgotha. But as he walked down that lonely road, he was carrying with him the sins of all the disciples to take on the cross. The sins of the times when they wouldn't stand up to him, stand up for him. He was also taking with him all the sins of all the people that were angry and confused because he wasn't doing what he thought that they, he should do. And he was taking with him to the cross all the sins of the people who blindly follow the crowd. And he took them to the point on Calvary where they nailed him on the cross and he died for them. My friends, I'm here to tell you today that no matter what sin you have, no matter how you fit into that crowd, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He took them away. As he lay there on the cross, nailed in pain and in agony, he took each and every one of your sins, no matter how bad, no matter how horrible, and took them on the cross with him because you are his chosen child. My dog, Emily, She drives me nuts. But you know what? I feed her. I pick up after her. And it comes out of every orifice in her body. (laughs) And sometimes it's difficult. (laughs) Sometimes I want to put her in that dimension that doesn't exist. But I do it anyway. Why? Because she's my dog. Okay, family, I know. You think it's your dog. But she's my dog. And I love her. And she's part of our family. And I care for her, and I love her, and, she, and I, when she comes up to me, I give her a pet on the ear because she belongs to me, and I love her. And see, you are God's child. It doesn't matter what sins you wallow in and how many things you do out in the backyard. God loves you and died for you. And that is the message of today, of Palm Sunday, of the, all the crowds, is that Jesus loves you so much. He died for you. In his name, amen.